Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Emery, and this will be part one of my Private Equity Explained series, where I'll be going over the individual components to the entire private equity process. If you have not seen the introduction to this series, you could click the link in the description. In this video, I will be going over the financial modeling aspect of private equity. Essentially, how do private equity firms write financial models to analyze their deals? I'll be starting a blank Excel spreadsheet and just go over a very simple basic model so that, you know, the general public will probably understand. Anyways, enough talking, let's get to the spreadsheet. Okay, got my drink ready. Let's get started. So first things first, let's just go back to the very beginning, right? What is even the point of, you know, trading or investing in anything? Well, at the root of it, what you're trying to do is you're kind of buying something and then this thing either makes you money or somehow when you sell it, you're selling it at a higher point than what you bought it for, right? Some pretty common things that people do, you know, stocks, obviously, you know, there's houses like real estate, uh, it could be some something other random things like sneakers. Nowadays, people are doing, you know, crypto, you know, like Shiba Inu, I don't know, NFTs. With all these things, essentially, you know, things like houses or stocks kind of some somehow make you money along the way. Like stock will pay you dividends, houses will collect rent. But some of these other things are just things that you could put your money in. These things have some sort of value and you're kind of hoping that, you know, when you sell these things that uh, you're getting back more than what you paid for, right? Everybody's attempting to make money, but some of us actually do make money, right? <laughs> Let's go back to a simple example. Let's just say I buy a pair of Jordan 1 Chicago's, right? So I buy a pair of shoes. Today is uh, November the 22nd and I pay, I don't know, 1500 for this pair of shoes, right? And then a, a year later, this pair of shoes uh, goes to, let's say $3,000, right? So what happened here? We bought something for 1500 and we sold it for 3000 So normally what we calculate here is, you know, this thing made me 1500 bucks, right? Because it doubled the value over a year. And normally this is what we call, you know, a profit, right? So we made 1500 profit in a year buying a pair of Jordan 1 Chicago's. Now, when we're talking about stocks, a lot of times people like to talk about percentage returns. So this is term called gross returns, which is like a percentage of how much profits you made versus how much money you put into this thing, right? So I spent 1500 bucks and I made 1500 bucks and my gross returns is 100%. That makes sense because I made, you know, 100% of my original investment over this period of time. And there's also another concept called annual returns, generally in stocks, right? What this means is just how much gross return you made over the number of years, right? So obviously since we made this uh, over one year, um, so when you subtract these numbers, divided by 365, because Excel works in days, again, 100%, right? So this part is a simple example of, you know, generally these are how stocks are looked at, you know? I made 100% gross return on this investment and 100% annually. Now in private equity, um, a lot of firms don't use this number, annual return, to find out how much money they're making their investors, right? So let's say private equity. So let's say this is my private equity firm. Um, a lot of times, you know, when you hear hedge funds and public stocks, people quote annual returns. But in private equity, there's this concept of closed-end funds that kind of does not make a lot of sense if you're trying to calculate this number called annual return. So let's take this, let's go back to this example. I buy a pair of Jordan 1 Chicago's. Um, in one year, I double my money and I sell it in a year later for 3,000, right? So after I sell it, I decide to take my profits, you know, $3,000 and buy two pairs of Jordan 1, I don't know, Royals, right? So I decided to reinvest all my initial money plus my profits into two pairs of Jordan 1 Royals for $3,000, right? Now, let's say another year down the road, I turn this into 6,000 bucks, right? 
So now my two pairs of Jordan 1 Royals after, you know, in 2023, I sold it for 3,000 per pair and that gets me to $6,000 coming back to me. So what happened in this scenario is now over two years, I made 4,500 and my gross return is now 300, right? This is three times 1,500. Now my annual return nowadays will be 150% because 300 over two years is 150 per year, right? What happened here was I was able to take my profits here from my original pair of Jordan 1 Chicago's because I sold it and bought something else called, uh, you know, two pairs of Jordan 1 Royals. And I was able to reinvest my original money plus profits into something else that made me even more money another year down the road, right? This concept of closed end funds is the idea that you can't really take out, you know, your money during the fund term. So the idea here is I somehow was able to sell my Jordan 1 Chicago, take profits and reinvest it into something else in this scenario, right? But in private equity funds, let's say I buy a piece of land and I need to build a condo on top of it. Um, a year in, maybe I'm digging underground for foundation, I pretty much cannot sell, right? Because until I build a condo, I really, I'm not creating too much value there. So I can't really just sell like I did in this scenario and reinvest that profit into something else, right? I kind of need to sit on it until my entire condo is done. The idea is your, your money is kind of locked in I, you know, for the most part in this fund term. So you cannot reinvest profits. That's kind of the key here. So what they have to consider in a private equity fund is you kind of need to replicate the fact that you can as an alternative, right? Because why would I invest into a private equity fund when in this scenario, I can take out money and reinvest my profits, right? So there's this idea of compounding, which means you're making money on top of the previous money, right? So let's describe this scenario in just plain words. I'm doubling my money every year, right? So this is what's happening here. 1,500 to 3,000 to 6,000, I double my money every year, right? So if I double my money every year, my compounding, compounded annual return should be 100%, right? Because I double my money every year. Instead of the simple annual where I say, oh, this is how much I made based off of my original amount. I'm saying here, I make 100% every year based on my last year's amount. So this idea of compounding kind of takes away the fact that, you know, you can't take out your money early, right? So let's take this example again. I don't, let's say I buy a, you know, um, lemonade stand. And, you know, I need to rebrand this lemonade stand. I need to sell my lemonade until I make a good margin. And then I decide, and then I decide to sell my business, right? So let's say I bought it for 1500 and two years later, I sell it for 6000 So this kind of replicates this top scenario. Technically, these things are still the same. You know, our profits are still 4500 gross annual, right? So, you know, how do we find this thing called compounded annual return? Well, in Excel, there's a function called XIRR function, but the actual term is called IRR, which stands for internal rate of return. Right? Essentially, it's trying to capture this idea of how much compounded returns I'm getting. How much money am I making above the previous year's amount, right? So let's see, let's just say in this scenario, right? So the function is XIRR, which takes values and dates and calculates it for you, right? The way it works, you kind of need a negative amount and then a positive amount. Okay. So, you know, let's take this. These these are my values and these are my dates, right? So if I press enter here, I should get 100%, which I do. So it means IRR. So it means on a compounded annual basis, I make 100%. So I double my money every year in this scenario, right? The only reason we look at IRR because we need to take in consideration that other people are able to compound their returns. And since our money is stuck, we also need to calculate our compounded return. Okay, so let's move on to our next concept. And this is a pretty important concept. This is a concept of capital stack, right? So this is closely related to this other concept that you may hear a lot in private equity called leveraged buyout, right? I don't know why, you know, this is such a difficult term. It's honestly pretty simple in that 
you are taking on debt to buy an asset, right? A lot of times in private equity, you're, you know, you're taking on debt to buy a business, right? A very simple example of a leveraged buyout, and you know, most people will go through this in their adult life, is pretty much, you know, buying a house. Right? So let's say for example, there's a house and it's five hundred thousand dollars. This is clearly not <laughs> realistic in Toronto, maybe like Midwest, somewhere in the States, like Ohio or something, right? And what realistically happens here, you know, there's cash and there's this thing called mortgage, right? Most people will likely, you know, take on a mortgage to buy a house instead of, you know, straight up paying all cash out of their own pockets, right? A lot of times, you know, people are taking on 80% loan to value. So, um, yeah, so you know, the bank gives them 400,000, they just put up the balance and they have to put up 100,000 in cash, right? So in this scenario, you're technically leveraging to buy an asset, right? You're taking on debt from the bank to buy a house. So this is essentially a leveraged buyout. Obviously, you know, in a scenario of a private equity firms, you know, this will probably be, you know, buying a business, I don't know, lemonade stand, you know, um, Instead of a mortgage, you know, there's just some sort of business loan and then the rest you put it in cash, right? So the idea of a capital stack is essentially this, right? So you have money that's going in. This is how much funding that you have and this is how much you're spending on these things, right? So this will be called uses of capital and this is to be called sources of capital, right? Uses of capital is what you're spending the money on and sources of capital is where you're getting this money from, right? Obviously your uses have to balance your sources because you need to come up with the amounts that you need to use, right? Why is this important? Is because when you're calculating private equity, the idea is you're trying to calculate cash to equity, right? How much money are you actually putting in out of your own pockets versus how much money is actually coming back to your bank account in your own pockets, right? If I buy a house for 500,000, technically the amount that's coming out of my bank account is 100,000, not 500,000, right? So technically my initial investment into this house is negative 100,000. But over here, you can buy an asset that's 500,000 for only 100,000 of your own money. So why do people use mortgages or why do people take on loans? It's kind of the idea of, you know, leverage, right? The key point in leverage is um, you are borrowing at a cheaper rate than how much the money will make you. Let's take this as a simple example. Let's say, you know, the mortgage right now is 5% interest, right? And I buy a house in a year, this house goes to 600,000, right? So let's look at two scenarios. There's a leverage, scenario and unleveraged scenario, right? So in this leverage scenario, this is our capital stack. We're buying a house, 500,000, 100,000 is our own money, 400,000 is coming from the bank. Now let's look at an unleveraged scenario, right? So we're buying a house for 500,000 and we're straight up just putting up 500,000, right? We don't take on our mortgage. Let's see the difference in return in these two scenarios. So let's start with the unleveraged, right? So in today, I buy a house for 500,000, right? So negative, oops, negative 500,000. And in a year, oops. This house is now worth 600,000, right? I don't have a loan, I don't need to pay down any loan. So this is is what happens in the unleveraged scenario. I buy a house 500,000, in a year I get back 600,000. So let's go back to these metrics over here, right? So what happened is in my profits, whoops. So I made 100,000 on this transaction, right? Because 
I paid 500, I got 600 back. What is my gross returns now? Well, it's obviously this divided by my original amount, right? 20%. So I made 100,000 on 500,000, I made 20%. Annual returns is obviously just divided by one. So let's just say 20%, right? I don't know, divided by one just for, simpl for simplicity sakes. In my unleveraged scenario, I have 100,000 of profit, 20% annual returns, 20%, 20% gross, 20% annual return, right? Now let's take this scenario for the leveraged scenario, right? Instead of 500,000, technically of our own money that comes out of our bank account, we're paying down, we're just putting in 100,000, right? That's our initial investment into this house. Now what happens here is, you know, at the end of, so let's say cash out in leverage scenario, right? So obviously we get house of 600,000 back. This is how much money we're getting from selling the house, right? But now we have a mortgage, right? We have the mortgage, so we gotta pay down our mortgage. You know, for simplicity's sakes, we're not paying down monthly payments. So let's just say mortgage, right? So for mortgage, we have 400,000. So that's this amount here. So it's gotta be negative 400,000, right? Since, you know, mortgages have interest, so we also gotta pay down our interest, right? The interest is at 5%, so that's 400,000 times 0 0.05, right? Negative. Okay, so what? how much do we, money do we really get out of this house if we're taking on a loan, right? If we sum this, we get 180,000, right? So technically, in a year, this is the amount that we actually get back in our bank account. So what happened here? Well, we've made $80,000 now instead of 100,000, right? Because now we there's a cost of interest, so we gotta pay down the interest. But since we're only putting in 100,000 initially, we're making 80% returns now versus 20%, which is a pretty big difference, right? 80 divided by 100 versus 100 divided by 500, right? So why does leverage get us a lot higher, you know, returns versus unleveraged? is because if our house went from 500 to 600, technically that's a 20% increase, right? If somebody's offering us 5% cost to make 20%, it only makes sense that we will make more money in this scenario, right? That's why, you know, a lot of people in private equity take on leverage or leverage buyouts, mostly because debt is cheaper than how much money they would have made originally without debt. Okay, so now let's put everything together and actually build a simple model. Let's go back to this example of leverage scenario of buying a house, right? So here's my leverage scenario of buying a house. House. So let's say this is my house. What happens in a house is obviously you collect rent, right? And then there's just expenses that you have to pay. So rent is part of revenues. So let's just say this is revenues, rent. And then we have expenses, which might be, you know, property, taxes, um, insurance, utilities, maintenance. And sometimes we have, you know, property management, right? So if I buy a house, Obviously, I get money in and I got to pay out some of these expenses, right? And let's say this is uh, today on day one. Again, from this scenario, we need to know equity because at the end of the day, what we're trying to calculate is just literal cash coming in and literal cash going out, out of our bank accounts, right? So on day one, technically, let's say this is bank account, right? On day one, technically the amount that goes out of our bank account is $100,000 because that's how much we're paying, right? To buy this house. So this is the amount that goes out on day one. Now let's say on a monthly basis, we start to collect rent, right? So on the first month we collect, let's just say $2,000, right? $2,000. This is how much money we're collecting in rent. And uh, let's say this is how much we collect every single month. 
And now we have our expenses, right? Property tax, insurance, utilities, maintenance, and property management. For simplicity's sake, let's just say property tax, I don't know, 2,000 bucks a year. So let's, in Canada, you pay it in six months periods. So, you know, you pay a thousand over these three months and now you pay a three a thousand over these three months, right? Oh, we should have an extra month here. So property tax, 300 bucks for six months of the year. So this would be $2,000. Uh, insurance, let's just say 50 bucks. Utilities, $100. Maintenance, you know, it's kind of spotty. It could be here and there. Let's just say, I don't know, $100 every three months, right? Uh, these things are kind of just recurring. So you got to pay them every month. Property management is just a function of, you know, revenues, right? A lot of times people charge it on revenue, so let's just say this is the amount, right? Okay. Let's say that these are all of our expenses, right? So these are what we call operating expenses. Anything that's related to, you know, running the actual house like you cannot avoid any of these expenses like you have to pay them right so let's say we have our revenues and we have our expenses right uh, now we have this line called net operating income so how much money do we make income basis based off of our rent and our expenses right So these are, you know, the actual cash that comes in from operating or renting out this house, right? Now, you know, for more technical things in, you know, non-real estate businesses, they will probably call EBITDA, but either way, you know, operating income is how much money do you make from the core of the business, right? Like now there are obviously things that also cost you money that are not part of operations, right? Again, we got to think about it on a cash basis, like how much cash really comes into our bank account at the end of the month, right? Obviously from earlier, since we leveraged, we took on a mortgage, we got to pay mortgage interest, right? So that's one item that uh, we need to pay down mortgage interest. Since you're buying a house, you know, sometimes there just might be bigger projects that are not maintenance that you need to pay down, right? like redo the flooring or you know take down a drywall or replace a furnace or something right like it's not really maintenance because sometimes these are just like fixing the small things but these are just bigger things that you really need to spend cash on right in uh real estate and i guess in regular businesses this is what people will call capital expenditure like how much money you're spending capital that are not exactly necessary, but sometimes you just kind of need to do it. That's why it's not an operating income. It's like you don't you don't always in every single case have to replace the flooring, but every single case you need to pay utilities, right? So this is something called capital expenditure. Obviously, this is a simplified model. You know, if we're working with operating businesses, there's you know changing working capital. Sometimes you know you take on new loans. When you take on new loans, there's obviously like extra cash that comes in, right? So for simplicity's sake, let's just say other money out that are not part of operations is interest and capital expenditure, right? In the earlier scenario, we said interest is 5%. So, you know, our monthly interest payments will be uh, times 5%, right? Negative divided by 12. Oh, hmm, okay. Okay, this is too much money in. <laughs> We're gonna go cash flow negative. Okay, let's just say this is 3%, right? These are the amounts that you gotta pay out for mortgage interest, right? And for capital expenditure, let's just say, you know, I buy a furnace, you know, here for 500 bucks. I buy a stove for 500 bucks. Um, and I gotta redo the flooring, you know, here for, I don't know, $600, right? These are my outflows of cash that um, 
the formatting is just absolutely terrible and it is triggering me here, but it's so much effort and I don't need to do that right now. Okay. So here are our cash outflows that are not part of operations, right? So non cash operating, non cash expenses, right? Or just non cash outflows, non operating cash outflows. Oh my God, I can't think. So these amounts here, oops, are, you know, amounts that goes out as well outside of operations, right? And obviously at the end of the day, you know, house sale, right? We got to sell our house here and we kind of figured that this would be 600,000, right? You know, 600,000 is how much we decide to sell our house. So at the end of the day, the amounts that really comes into our bank account, you know, on a monthly basis is this plus this, right? We're technically getting $300 added to our bank account after our operating income minus our other outside expenses that we need to worry about, right? So net net basis, we're getting $300, 317 back on these months. And, um, and these are the amounts that comes back, you know, on these other months, right? Obviously, at the end of 12 months, we sell our house. So now we, you know, have our house for sale, right? And then obviously we got to pay down our mortgage, which we know, you know, since we didn't haven't made any payments is 400,000, right? So, um, okay, so technically at the end of, you know, the year we get 600, we need to subtract out, you know, 400 and this is the amount of cash that really comes into our bank account at the end of the day, right? It's obviously not this simple. There's a lot of costs like legals, closing costs, you know, like property, you know, land transfer tax. Anyways, just to keep it simple, these are the actual amounts that comes into our bank account, right? So, you know, as we learned in the first here, the actual metric that people really look at is IRR, right? And there's a function called IRR. So let's say IRR. Now we know the actual cash that we need to put up and the cash that comes back. Now this is just a simple IRR calculation, right? So if I buy this house, um, this will be my IRR. So compounded basis, I will be making 107.66% in this deal. So this is it. This is a simple example that, you know, a private equity firm would use to analyze the deals. Obviously, you know, if we're doing something small like lemonade stand, instead of rent, it'll probably just, you know, revenues from lemonade, right? Lemonade sales. And then we'll probably have a line here for, you know, cost of goods sold. For the people who, you know, have some knowledge of business, this will be a cost of goods sold. And then we have to adjust for, you know, working cap, working capital changes. Anyways, honestly, this is not too different. Like at the end of the day, this still, the goal here is to find this amount, right? Technically, instead of bank account, it should be cash to equity, right? There you have it. There's a simple model for private equity. Again, if you guys have any questions or comments about the model or anything else in general, leave it below and I'll answer it when I see them. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'll see you guys in the next one.